at Maine campus, where she sees patients as a nurse practitioner and an IBC LLC. This clinic is a provider-run clinic that sees both mother and mothers and infants with a focus on breastfeeding problems, but for full pediatric and family medicine care as well. She's also the director of, of advanced practice registered nursing at Metro Health. She received her MSN at Drexel University in Philadelphia and also a Master of Arts degree from John Carroll University in Religious Studies with a focus on healthcare disparities. She is a pediatric nurse practitioner for over 30 years with most of her career spent in newborn nursery at Metro Health. An area of interest is neonatal abstinence syndrome. She has published in this topic in 2018 in Holistic Nursing Practice with her co-investigation of the safety of Reiki therapy on newborns at risk for neo abstinence syndrome. She's a member of Ohio Board of Nursing Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Advisory Committee, the 2016 winner of the AANP State Award for Excellence, and a board member of the Advanced Practice Provider Executive. She's also an advocate for all parents, mothers, and infants. Please welcome Ms. Sandra Esper. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm from across the way here for, at Metro Health, but we really love UH over there. We share the same passion that you all do for your patients, and especially in pediatrics. Thank you for having me. I know you just had lunch, so if you need to move, please do. I don't mind if you're fidgeting. They, they need me to stay near the microphone because uh, there's people on the web, I guess, so I will stay by. Uh, no disclosures. You heard about my breastfeeding clinic. This is not an advertisement for that. So, um, you know, I just want to update you. I know you're mostly peds, APRNs, and I just want you to have a little bit more knowledge of medicines related to breastfeeding and more um, information about breastfeeding. This is our breastfeeding we'll review, breastfeeding physiology, and and potential problems related to breastfeeding, and then we'll describe pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic treatments for common breastfeeding um, problems that you may be able to incorporate in your practice. Are most of you primary care peds? Would you raise your hand if you're a primary care peds? Okay. And how about acute care? And all peds? Any family? Anything else? Others? Special peds. Okay, great. Yeah. So you may or may not come across some of these issues, but you know, family, friends. You know, sometimes it's helpful to to have some of this if, if it's not work related. Um, benefit breastfeeding. I don't want to belabor that point. I think everybody knows that those. Um, you know, for the baby and for for mom, there are so many many um, benefits, health benefits for both. So breastfeeding physiology. So I just wanted to review that for you. Mo many of us did not get much of that in school, and that's true of physicians as well. So it, it helps to make sense of what you're doing when you treat patients, and you know if they're having problems with weight gain or other issues. You know, understanding the background of this will help you to decide what to choose when you're treating um, weight loss, things like that, or problems. So genesis, there's stages. So lactogenesis one is the secretory initiation. That's during the pregnancy, um, and it's hormonally driven pregnancy. And the few few first days postpartum, and that's endocrine driven. Very different than what happens a little late after the baby's born. Um, and that begins around 16 weeks of the pregnancy. That's progesterone driven. It increases in the second half of pregnancy. Um, the second phase is the secretory activation phase, and that's this is where we're more interested. Stage three is more when you're seeing the baby, so a little bit more about that. So after the placenta is delivered, there's a rapid drop in progesterone, and then there's an elevation of prolactin, cortisol, estrogen. Um, oh, sorry, that shouldn't be in there, the progesterone, but it's but dropping, oxytocin is rising, growth hormone, and gluco, glucocorticoid and, and, and insulin is um, rising after delivery. These are triggered by the secretory activation of the mammary secretory epithelial cells, and those are called lactocytes. Phase 
the prolactin secretion is from the anterior pituitary, okay? So any woman that might have a pituitary tumor or a problem like that, that you can see where that could be an issue. So it's always good to know maternal health and those types of things, and we can talk a little more about that in a bit. Um, so prolactin secreted from the anterior pituitary, and it's a, a negative feedback system with dopamine as the inhibitor. For those of you who like this type of thing, that's the mechanism. Colostrum, of course, most of you know, is secreted the first one to three days. It's it's teaspoons, so you're not going to see. You have to hand express it. If you give a mom a pump the day after delivery, the day of delivery, you know, because you're worried right away about the baby, maybe the, there's hypoglycemia. Um, you're not going to see anything. They've got to manually express, and even then, you're lucky to get anything. It's it's almost like cottage cheese when you can get it out those first few days. So, but it's it's like a, a protein bar or a power bar. Um, it's a high antibody white cells, secretory IgA, protein, and fat-soluble AE and K, all wonderful for the baby to be getting. Um, and you expect weight loss. Every baby loses weight, and you know that, right? All babies lose weight. Even formula-fed babies lose weight. If you're stooling so much after delivery, um, all babies lose weight. It's rare when they gain weight and question if the weight was correct, if, if they were gaining weight those first few days. Um, most production, you, you'll hear mom say my milk came in. You know, that's not really true. As you see, lactogenesis has been going on, so this process has been going on. Um, full milk is starting to be produced, not just the colostrum, but most women will say my milk came in, and a lot of providers say that, that too. So two to four is when the big milk production um, starts. Um, so expect weight loss, right, those first few days, up to 10% from birth weight. But don't panic. Please don't panic at 10% of weight loss. So you work with these. Um, I go down to 12% easily if the story is right. Okay? If mom is saying, oh, I was engorged last night, you know, I'm at 11 and a half, 12% weight loss, the baby's voiding, you know, let's say we're four days out, the baby's vo voided four or five times. Mom is is telling me she was engorged last night. She's leaking milk. Um, give it a little while. Don't immediately go to supplementation. And we'll talk more about that. So expect less. Um, and this is three. So that's around day nine. So you, you can see this is where the hormones are play far less of, a, uh, of an importance in, in breastfeeding and, and the milk production um, around day nine into weaning. And so then it's autocrine control. So you may have heard supply and demand. The more you nurse, the more you make. If you've got twins or triplets and you're nursing, you're going to make two to three times as much as a singleton would, a singleton mom would, because it's driven by the autocrine system. The more you nurse, the more you make. Okay. Uh, lactogenesis is maintained by the regular removal of milk and nipple stimulation, which triggers prolactin. It's, again, the anterior pituitary gland with the oxytocin formed in the posterior pituitary gland. The mammary gland has to receive the hormonal signal. So if you have a woman that has some sort of issue, breast reduction, um, a lot of glandular tissue, that will mess with the milk production, right? Because the stimulation of the hormones is not happening to that tissue. Um, again, we talked about prolactin and hypothalamic inhibitory factors. Um, prolactin stimulates, we talked about that, epithelial cell proliferation. So this is very much driven in the epithelial cell system, um, which induces milk protein synthesis. Emptying of the breast, which is, the breast is never completely empty. I know moms will pump or tell you, oh, no more is coming out, but it just will keep coming. So there might be a little lag time, but it'll then start up again, and at least drops will start producing. So it's not, it's not like a, a balloon or bag that fully empties and then has to wait to refill it again. Um, so the baby suckling is thought to be the most important factor. We're still learning, although there's tons of research on breastfeeding medicine. Um, so there's a lot out there to, if you are, are interested in looking. 
Um, prolactin concentrations increase rapidly with sucking of nipple stimulation on the nerve endings there. Sometimes piercing, sometimes these things alter that stimulation. A lot of scar tissue. Um, oxytocin stimulates the milk ejection letdown reflex. That's also the feel good hormone, so women will feel peaceful, sometimes sleepy. So be careful, you know, if they're new mom and they get sleepy, they can sometimes drop the baby. So always make sure that the baby's safe in their arms or in the bed. Um, Myoepithelial cells to round the milk secreting cells and contract. It forces the milk into the ducts from the alveolar lumens. And then this whole feedback uh, inhibitor of lactation, that's a polypeptide that's removed with nursing. If you don't remove that, the, the mammary glands start to involute. So I tell moms all the time, if you stop nursing today, there's a good chance your milk will be gone within the next, next week because you're not stimulating this, this fill um, cycle be interrupted. You have to be nursing or pumping or both to keep this going or your milk quickly goes away because it's it's autocrine um, driven at this point. You know, remember this change in lactogenesis 3, it's now on this autocrine system, not just hormones. Overview of, of breast anatomy. Um, um, anything in particular that I want to point out to you, you know, they fill and contract, fill and contract with nursing. So you'll see women's breasts get bigger. Not always. Some women don't experience that. Fifty percent of all women do not feel let down or necessarily much change in their breasts. So that's not uncommon. I'll have women come to the clinic saying, I'm not sure. I had this wonderful case where a woman came, the baby was two months old, thriving, growing, and she said, I don't think I have enough milk because my breasts don't change size. The baby's done in 10 minutes. We did a transfer weight, and I think it was getting six, seven ounces, a ridiculous amount. There's just an efficient baby, you know, with, with uh, a mom producing very well. So that was a nice, easy one. Um, this four we're not going to talk about because that's mammary involution and that's when you're you know weaning the baby um, and so I, I don't want to spend my time there. Uh, so as I mentioned a little bit, there's lots of factors that could interfere with lactogenesis, right? So these are these are a few. There's there's other odd and rare things too, but diabetes. These are some of the big ones on the first ones. Diabetes for mom, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, hypothyroidism, and then breast reduction I mentioned, these other items too. So any of these things can cause so um, chest and breast trauma, radiation or burns of breast, pituitary brain surgeries, issues, tumors, hypopituitarism, BMI, we're seeing more research that shows obesity can impact milk production, um, unfortunately. So a BMI greater than 26 can impact. So, you know, watch that in the moms that you, you know, if you're a baby, you know, is mom overweight? What's her BMI? Look at those things. Lewis, kidney failure, heavy smoking. We still recommend um, breastfeeding with smokers, but if they're smoking heavily, which is a pack a day or more, their milk production usually goes down. And there is, you probably know, there are chemicals that do go through the breast smoke, but it's still recommended to breastfeed. Um, the benefits outweigh the risk. Um, anyone with severe calorie restriction, we usually don't see that in this country. Um, hypoprolactinemia, of course, <laughs> and, uh, anything related to uh, hormones of, of breastfeeding um, could cause a problem. Hypertension and then hormonal birth control, uh, we have to be careful with. The research is, is kind of neutral on that, and I talk with our OBs all the time about um, birth control. Um, um, it they, they doesn't really affect, but I anecdotally, women will tell me all the time. I start my birth control, um, even even uh, you know progesterone-based birth control ball, and they'll say I noticed a difference, or I got the depo shot, and I noticed right away my supply went down. So anecdotally, I'm hearing it, but the research isn't bearing that out right, right at this time. And but you're in practice a long 
time. Things change <laughs> always. You gotta keep up. Uh, so interfering factors with lactogenesis C-section. So that's newer information. I think a lot of us who've done neonatology have known that for a while. But, um, you know, a C-section, because there's so much manipulation, usually a first-time C-section is, is, is because of a problem, right? There's something urgent or emergent that is happening. So there's other factors going on. And its delivery and the manipulation with the C-section, IV fluids, more medications, all those things can interfere with milk production. I always see C-section moms, almost always, never say always, almost always see C-section moms a few days delayed with their full supply. Common. Always know what kind of delivery it was when you're Retain placenta, so you know that one you don't always know that's happening, but mom often will describe that they're either bleeding a lot or they're getting big clots. So if they're telling you that, I usually have that discussion of how's your bleeding um, to, to see if that may be an issue that they may need a clean out to do that because that will decrease their supply. Um, breast surgeries, like I said, reduction, enhancement, aug augmentation usually does not impact pack milk supply. So a lot of women now are getting augmented breasts and it usually does not interfere with breastfeeding. But we can and usually does. They can be successful, but they usually have to supplement. Um, and then insufficient maternal glandular tissue. So um, for most of you, you're not looking at the mom breasts, I don't think, in, in your clinic setting. But part of what I do is look at them, watch a feeding. I look at mom's breasts. I, I see baby latch. I look at the baby closely, like uh, like uh, Brandy described. I do anything else they need because I'm a feed person, right? Um, so if they come come with a distended abdomen that they came to the breastfeeding clinic, I'll work them up for that. And get them get them readmitted. Um, so you know, seeing the insufficient glandular tissue, usually the hallmark is there's big. It's usually more than an inch and a half between a woman's breasts, um, and and often the breasts look tubular. And often, to the side, most of you probably aren't going to see that or say, "Hey, let, let me see that." <laughs> um, sometimes I have the lactation consult. That most will often tell me, "Oh, yeah, they told me that." It doesn't always mean that there's a milk production problem. It doesn't always. So you have to give them a chance. I always. Just wait and see, but track closely. Um, for the infant side, so things that interfere with lactogenesis, so of course prematurity, even those late preterms, I, I love late preterms and I've researched them quite a bit and, and love dealing with them. They just don't have that suck, right? Those 36 weekers, they may be healthy and go to the normal nursery, but they just do not have the strength. They'll, they'll pee out after five or 10 minutes. So they're not triggering that lactogenesis mechanism, right? To get, you've got autocrine, we're kicking autocrine, autocrine control and they're not able to do it just from um, their prematurity. Um, of course, any neurologic, metabolic disorder, any oral issues, cleft palates, cleft lips, they can't get as good a, a grasp, so they're not stimulating that breast tissue and the nipple stimulation as well. And then some of the more common things, a tethered labial frenulum, so the upper lip, um, that's not too, super common. I always look for that. It, it has to really be pulling the lip down where the lip can't move to get on the breast. And then a little glossy, a tongue tie. Um, you know, again, I've seen pretty bad tongue ties. They're fine. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little more. Separation from mom, so a mom who has gestational hypertension and has to go mag after delivery and maybe the baby is sick or has to go to the nursery or NICU, um, of course, that can cause a delay in the whole process of breastfeeding. And then insufficient frequency or duration of feeding. So typically when a baby's first born in the whole first month, every hour and a half to two and a half hours, and it's from the start of one feeding to the start of the next. I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but a lot of moms don't know that. You know, I'll say if you started at noon, the next feeding, even if you didn't finish till one, because you're playing and changing diapers, and the next feeding has to be no later 
darker than three o'clock. So two, probably two o'clock. So you will feel like all you're doing is feeding this baby. So usually tell me. Okay. When it gets better, is the bigger their stomach is, that's when they can go longer. When their stomach's this big, if you're on the on the web, there's you know the size of a walnut and egg. When your stomach's that little, you just can't hold much. So as their body grows, they can hold more. That's when they can go longer in between feeding. If you've ever done a liquid diet, oh, you're hungry all the time, right? You want to drink, drink, drink because there's nothing really staying in there as long. And that's how breast milk is. It's lighter healthier, um, so they're hungry a lot. Um, some issues, you know, families misunderstanding the breastfeeding cycle. I get a lot of families saying, I want my baby on the schedule. Why, you know, my mom said she should be on a schedule. There's no such thing with breastfeeding. You have to feed a lot. It is intense. It's just you who can do those feedings for a woman. Um, and so it does feel more than I think they expected. Even if they took every class, read every book, so many of them are just blown away. And I'm sure you see that. Like, oh, I didn't buy it. I wasn't expecting this. This is every two hours that I never sleep. Um, and then sometimes they'll think the baby's done feeding. Often, this is, you all know this, you know, often they need to burp. A baby will stop feeding if they need to burp. So always offer a burp and see if they'll go back on. And that's the same with bottle feeding. But burp less with breastfeeding, but always burp, because I can always get them to relatch if I get a good burp out of them. Uh, so um, so then they burp and they go back on. Um, and then if they're not latched well, if that latch isn't on well, then of course the supply will be down, and, and sometimes it's painful for them. And then missed feeding cues. I think well, she's got to be done. I just fed for 25 minutes, and they give the pacifier. So I really don't like pacifiers because of that, because of missed feeding cues. I do like them. You all know, you know, with SIDS prevention, and so we usually recommend at one month, and that's the AAP guideline too. When breastfeeding is well established, then they can offer the pacifier around three to four weeks. But otherwise, it's the same more than the baby if it's a full-term baby in my mind that, that's you know baby because they've got to be done and they're and they're not um and feeding is too early to thinking that they're done um introduction of bottles so you're you're baby friendly here and preaching to the choir you know you don't want a bottle especially that first month i usually recommend waiting until four to six weeks, if ever. In a perfect world, you're always available. You gear off from your job. <laughs> you get somebody sent to your house to help you. It would be great. Um, so avoid the bottle because sometimes the babies will refuse to go to the The infusion, I call it smart baby. They're like, that was easy. I didn't have to do hardly anything. So slow flow nipple, low flow nipple helps a little bit, but still faster than the breast. But the breast is hard. It's just, you know, different set of muscles that they're using to get that, let, especially the let down and get the milk flowing. Um, and then for supplementation, avoid it. Only use it in, if medically necessary um, and use as little as you can. Um, nipple shields. So a lot of people, I love nipple shields. I use them a lot, but they can cause hypoglactia. So you do not want to use them over time. You want to get rid of them as soon as you can. So we'll talk a little more. Um, maternal stress. So if you can get her to calm down, we know that women who are confident with their breastfeeding do better and have produce more milk. And family support, especially grandmother and significant other. If they don't support breastfeeding, it's often doomed. Um, and no, if a mom isn't making enough milk. So infant weight loss. And then keep her looking at that. Um, but again, don't panic at 10%. The whole picture. Okay. Use as little supplement as you can. And always try and use breast milk first. Get mom pumping. Um, and slow growth. So sometimes it's a, it's a big thing I see in clinic is low milk supply in my clinic. So um, a baby that's just slowly it took them a little longer than usual to get back to their birth weight. They're they're only gaining you know seven to ten grams a day. It's just not going as fast as you would like. 
Um, so look at what's going on with mom. How can we get her to produce more milk? Um, weight gain velocity. Um, use the appropriate growth, growth chart. So, you know, the Olson and the Fenton and the neonatal world, if you've got a late preterm or a preemie, don't, don't use World Health Organization because that only starts a term. Um, so use an alternate um, growth chart so you can appropriately track. So be careful of that um, for the preemies. Uh, term and late preterm, they have a slower catch-up. So I allow for that. A late preterm, I, you know, normally you want them back, back to their birth date around no later than two weeks of age. Make that a loose number. But with late preterms, of course they're not going to get there in two weeks. You've got to give them more time, okay, in that catch-up time. But you bring them back a lot. Okay. Bring them back a lot, the parents. So we go again. Just for weight checks, just because you're watching to make sure that they're gaining. Of course, not enough. Enough voids of stool, voids or stool. So voids for volume, um, you know, you probably know the little, uh, uh, to say day one, they should have one wet diaper. Day two, this is day of life. Day two of life, two. Day three, three. Day four, four. Day five, five. By day six, because mom's milk better be in by day six at the latest. Um, fully in, um, six wet diapers always in a 24-hour block of time. Parents are terrible about that because they're sleep deprived. They're like, oh, she had four this morning. I said, yeah, but 24 hours. Oh, oh. they do, do that to me. Like, no, I want you to go back 20 hours and tell how many. Right. Dual um, is a little bit trickier because <laughs> um, a lot of variety just like for or kids and adults, um, but at least a few stools a day, and usually a lot of stools, usually eight stools, ten stools, sometimes even more a day, lower, um, not as thick as formula. Not changing color, so you know the meconium when the baby is first born, and then there's a transition stool that's greenish, brownish, usually day two to for um, at the latest, and then you st should start seeing yellow stools, and usually often bright yellow stools. Um, if you're using formula, if the mom's supplementing, or if you are medically supplementing because you're worried about something with formula, the stools are not going to be yellow usually, or it might be a mix, so they may be brown and thicker, and you know, hate to use food, but or like peanut butter. Sorry. Oh, she said peanut butter. In your sandwich tonight. Um, and then, uh, of course, signs and symptoms of dehydration. I know you all know that. Um, excessively long time at the breast. So I've just told you don't cut them too short, but then if you're going long all the time. So greater than 40 minutes a lot of the time is probably too long. The first day or two, you know, they're they're trying to get the milk in, but then if you're at, you know, day four or five and that baby's on there a long, long time, and usually you don't see that separately. You're seeing other things. Maybe the weight gain isn't robust or not in quite enough voids. So, you know, long feeding. So I always ask, how long were you feeding the baby? Of course, and I've, I've had my share of those that I've worked with in the breastfeeding clinic. And then suboptimal transfer weight um, using a breastfeeding scale. You can't use the nursery type scales. Those are usually five gram scales. You need a breastfeeding scale that goes down to two gram um, to be able to do a milk transfer. I, I'm not a big fan of milk transfers because moms get nervous. I do, um, of course, but um, moms get nervous when when they don't look like they're transferring milk. And remember, we don't, we want them to be confident and relaxed. But transfer weight, you know, weighing the baby before and after the feeding um, can be helpful to give you some idea if there's just not very, very much milk. Then uh, without signs of milk production, if she says, I don't feel, like I said, 50% don't feel anything. Thing or don't feel let down really, um, but they'll, I don't see leaking of my milk. It's very common with a good supply that the other side leaks. So she's telling you that side's leaking when I'm feeding on the other side. That's a good sign of a good milk supply. Um, so you know you can start asking those. And she just asks them, Mom, do you think you have a good milk supply? And someone will say, I really don't. I'm not sure, but I don't. I'm not sure. 
I'm sure most of you are familiar, so these are the expected weight gains um, for the ages, and you know that first year is such a rapid growth. Um, so zero to four months, expect about 30 grams a day of weight gain, okay? Our, we have EPIC at Metro, and it calculates it all for me. It's great. I can see with the, the weight gain last visit. And then, it, you know, the, the, that fast velocity of growth in the beginning, and then it tapers off a little bit so you see four to six months a little bit before that's okay and then six to twelve months and then you're starting solids and other things at that point okay treatment to treat when to supplement the baby so of course careful assessment get information about mom mom history you know rotation consult of course if you you know if you're not sure but you, you guys have, have great rotation here oh my god UH. Um, uh, so if you need to supplement, use the minimal amount. And I'm talking, especially those first few days, you're, I'm talking two cc's. I'm not talking 20, 30, 40, 50 cc's. You're going to destroy breastfeeding when you do that much. I, I would so 60 cc's because it's done if you're using that much. And you use it briefly, two days, and then we get a, taper it off, get rid of it okay and tell mom we're going to get rid of this this is temporary only you're going to make milk this is temporary um, so use minimal amount okay um, prices express breast milk um, supplementing at the breast is fun with a supplemental nurse system sometimes you can trick the baby into thinking the feeding's all coming from the mom's breast by using it's a little tube system, or some people use a feeding tube with a syringe. And if you put it on the mom's nose, the baby thinks everything's coming from there, and you can avoid nipple confusion. Okay. It's less time for mom. It's a little bit of a hassle, the syringe feedings and stuff. But it's temporary, right? So we're just doing it for a short burst to help this baby gain weight is typically what it is. Um, what else to tell you? Um, baby thinks it's all coming from the rest. So to that, avoid the bowels in the first three to four weeks. Finger feed with a syringe or a dental syringe. I like dental syringes a lot because you can get it in there. You can cup feed. It's the cutest thing ever to see a baby cup feed. You sit them up and nap it like a kid. kitten. If you Google it, you'll see little videos of it. Um, and it works. It's enough. And it's a small amount because they, and then they get tired out. But it's enough. It builds for you and you don't have to, you know, destroy the whole breastfeeding cycle with too much implementation. Um, remember, you're altering the physiologic cycle of, you know, lactogenesis, so you want to be cautious. Um, so the treatment, refer to lactation, um, review your basic concepts of breastfeeding with the families, um, the latch and the time at breast, if it's a, a latch issue, sometimes if they're not latched well, usually you're getting a lactation consultant for that, um, depending on your comfort level with how skilled you are with those things. Um, skin to thin in the early phases helps stimulate hormones, so that's and it feels great for the mom and the baby. So the skin to thin pacifiers and bottles. Using both breasts, usually, if you hear a mom saying they're using one breast at a time, there is more behind that, and I don't want to bore you with that, but usually using both breasts gives you a better milk supply. So um, 10, 15, 20 minutes, and I'm talking the first two four weeks, um, and then a burp, other side five, maybe 10. So a total feeding of 20, maybe 30 minutes is usually the best milk supply. But then first they cluster feed, they wake up and they want a little snack like we all do. Okay. Um, so, okay. Switch nursing, we often, to get a supply going, we'll switch nurse the baby three or more times during a feeding, a breastfeeding vacation where we'll put the mom and baby, just don't do anything. I always try and get them. I tell them, if your family comes over, if you have visitors, they either have to bring food or clean your bathroom. That's tell them that, you know, and you are the queen. You're just there and taking care of that baby and nursing that first few weeks. Um, breast massage, Dr. Witt's office, is Dr. Dr. Sender with uh, Dr. Witt is the breastfeeding on the east side that I modeled my breastfeeding client, and she was so generous with her time and information. They do 
do amazing breastfeeding massage. Like it, it is beyond what most people do. Um, but know that any massage usually is helpful. There are things you can look of specific types of massage, um, but usually it's that stimulation of the breast that helps. And then where the mom actually is putting a little bit of the milk um, with her breast, and there's techniques the lactation consultant will teach. Um, and then relaxation and confidence. Okay. Um, after feedings is a way to get more milk, five to ten minutes. The body thinks there's more feeding time or a twin. But there's another baby here, so it's going to make more, more milk. Okay. Um, and then, fr like I said, frequent weight checks. Every other day, if I'm worried about somebody, I don't wait a week or two. I'm not going to let them be out there getting dehydrated is the way I think of it. Um, so I make sure I bring them back frequently. A nurse visit is fine. You know, it doesn't have to be you as a provider seeing every time. Um, but somebody checking that weight and you getting the report so you can oversee it. Um, hospital grade pump rental is, um, you know, a great thing. U UH rents them here, so you have that luxury. Um, insurance will often cover that if you are saying mom has hypogalactia, um, so sometimes it is covered. So a month or two, you know, and you can get that supply back up at the most. So Galactagog, so this is not medicines, but I wanted to give you some background. So, so the the herbal galactagogues and some of the others, um, the research does not really support the the use. So, a great great tool for you is the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. It, it is a phenomenal resource of research and you know lots of providers and physicians who are very interested interested in this topic, as am I. They have great guidelines, and at the end, I have resources for you. Those the guidelines are fan fantastic. Galactagogues, they'll tell you, mm, we don't really think there's enough science yet. Now, anecdotally, moms will tell me exactly what worked. I did this, and it worked, and I used this herb, and I, this is the only thing that worked, okay? Um, so, so we have to uh, honor that uh, uh, kind of um, women's wisdom and things that we haven't done enough research on yet. Okay. And if there's minimal risk, it's worth trying. Favorite treatments that off the bat, so if a woman comes to me and the baby's losing weight and we're starting to supplement, but we're not supplementing too much, um, I think is a common one that I'll start with. It's cheap. It's, you can do it in capsules. I always prefer capsules because you have to drink lots of the teas. So when moms are saying, should I drink a tea? Yeah, but you have to drink a lot of it to get the same benefit, right? Just like any medicine. Um, so I usually like capsules. So fenugreek is very common in, in the East. It's an herb. Um, you can use herbal tea, but again, three cups a day, 200 milliliters is probably not going to do it. So I usually do capsules. 570, 580 milligrams is a common in this country, common um, milligram. Um, so three capsules, three to four times a day. So I'm telling them to take nine, 11 capsules a day, 12 capsules a day. But I remind them, this is food. I mean, it's like I'm telling you to put lettuce in a capsule. It's not something, but everyone with pills is like, a pill? Why are you making me take all these pills? New, very new research says that their urine and their sweat must smell like maple syrup or it's not going to be effective. So you, they have to have that smell. So you warn them that they will get that smell. It's a side effect of fenugreek. It's very sweet and syrupy, like pancakes. Where's the pancakes? You know, I smell something. That's a good sign when they're taking this. Okay. And we use, we'll usually use it for a week or two and see the research on this go, is not clear. Some women say they have to continue to take it. Some women get that little bump up and, and don't have to continue to take it. So, you know, I tell them to watch closely if you if you were taking it and then you stop um, and you see, you think there's a decrease, then maybe we need to go back to it. So I tell them to buy one bottle. It's about 9 or $10 for uh, usually 180 in a bottle. Um, not too expensive. Insurance does not cover it. Um, Avoid asthma, nut allergies, diabetes, because it is very sweet. It can really mess with blood sugars or if she's hypoglycemic. Um, usually the asthma has to be where they're, they're being treated for asthma. So we talk about that. You know, when was the last time you had an asthma attack? Um, do you want to try it or we'll 
we'll try something else. Okay, go go is another one. Um, care you're using this, although this is very common. You'll see the products out there, the herbal teas or the combination products. Um, usually have go through fenugreek, blessed thistle. Those are the big big ones that and I'll talk about now. Um, so use the dried leaves. The fresh leaves are toxic. So in red there, don't use fresh leaves. Um, it can lower the blood sugar of mom. So caution with a diabetic or anyone at risk for blood sugar thing. Um, the tea is one tea spoon of dried leaves and eight ounces of water, steep your tea. Um, capsules, again, I prefer them. It's um, one gram basically two to four times a day until they see an increase. Usually with any of these, this is my rule of thumb, usually within three days you're going to see something. I would take, keep taking it for a week or, you know, the one bottle, but you're usually going to see it within three days. And so yeah, it's probably not going to be effective. Okay. Moringa is a superfood. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, you, you can do it for other things too. It's a very widely used over in Asia um, for lots of things. Um, so it contains vitamins, minerals, amino acids. Um, in Africa, um, in the Philippines, it's called malinge. And they use it in feeding programs to fight malnutrition. So it's a very, very cheap, wonderful herb that's used. And some women say that it helps their milk supply. One I had with preemie twins, one pound, one and a half pound preemie twins, who was able to pump only for 18 months. She did everything. Oh my gosh, every single thing I asked her to do, she tried. She said Moringa was the, the real deal breaker that really helped her milk supply. So anecdotally, you know, I, seems pretty at, at at best, you know, at worst. Um, so capsules, about a, a gram of twice a day, um, like unsafe to use the roots. So the products that you'll see in this country are, are the leaves and not the roots. And cause some GI disturbances, so you can watch for that. Shot of very root or wild asparagus is another one that I like. Um, more popular in India and China. Um, the dose is 600 milligrams four times a day. If you're using capsule, again, you'll see teas with this in it too. No adverse effects in, in the studies that are out there. But, the, you know, a lot of these don't have, have a lot of studies. And thistle or silymarin, um, it has flavolignans um, are the presumed active ingredient. Um, and they use typically the micronized silymarin, and that's the dose typically. Again, herbal things that don't seem to have any harm. It's like eating more food. And that's why I encourage you to look at it. For most of us, we can eat a lot. I could eat a lot of punch keys the other day. <laughs> you know, um, and it was no adverse effect, a little sick stomach maybe. Um, so rare side effects, GI disturbances, possible anaphylaxis with, if you're taking with ragweed plaid, so not common. No. And the more herbs that you'll see, fennel, nettles, there's tons. I mean, there's hundreds. I, I, I highlight for you the ones that are more common in this country to use. Um, and I wanted to bring those things that you might be able to suggest to your patients. If they're amenable, some people don't like herbs, they only want something that's prescribed, um, it's really your relationship with that family to see what, what's going to work for them. Please ask them what they're taking, though. If you're dealing with a, a child, an infant with, with a problem with breastfeeding, you know, what medicines are you taking? Are you taking herbal? You know, I always ask that to make sure. I say medicines and they think mainstream medicines. Um, and there's some products. Um, Mother's Love is one that's real popular with moms and has a combination. Um, again, teas require more volume. And a lot of people are tea drinkers, simple tea drinkers. Okay. And to... Um, um, that are prescribed. So domperidone, 
um, is something that we really don't use in this country. There's a long history of why we don't use it for breastfeeding, but um, suffice it to say, it's not common, although I do know lactation specialists who, who more like provider level that will get on this and, and get this for families. So it's moderate success in research for this, so that you can increase by 88 to 220 milliliters a day. That's, that's you know, if you have a baby that's not quite gaining as much as you'd like and that you get this much more milk, that's pretty good. And then one study showed up possibly a 50% increase with it. So it's a dopamine agonist um, and increases the PRL secretion. Typical dose is 10 to 20 milligrams per day TID for one to two weeks, and these are typically tapered off. Um, there's drow, xerostomia, GI disorders, ventricular arrhythmia, sudden death. I think there was one case of this in the literature. But you know, there's always there's always got to be one for anything. Tylenol has cases, right? Um, and then increase uh, QTC interview in older adults, but not they haven't seen that in these breastfeeding women. But they're cost with it. Um, it's an off-label use. Um, the FDA explicitly recommends against it to increase milk production. So I don't do it, but I do have colleagues that I know do it and, you know, say it's for another reason. <laughs> so, very widely used in Europe, but just not here because of the FDA. And the research doesn't really bear out, but, but that's, you know, where we're at right now. now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, right. So, so the question is about. Um, Herbal, why isn't there more information and studies? So let's let's do some more people, right? Let's family, let's do studies. Um, so why isn't there more information on it? Um, very good question. Um, it, if you've ever looked at research on food, it is very hard to study food. Is the simple answer is so multifactorial when you're studying a food product. You know, digestion, metabolism. So that's one of the reasons why it's very difficult to say if this is really working or not. And, you know, we're, I always say we're still in the dark ages. Um, I've been in medicine a long time, so, you know, we've got a ways to go. Um, we're getting there, but, you know, we have lots more research. Most of the things we do are, don't have a ton of evidence. We're getting there, but a lot of your practices don't. So, yeah, it's your comfort level with that. I say to Ma, I say, I disclose, the research doesn't show either way whether this is going to work or not. Okay. But I can tell you many moms have told me that this worked for them. So I'm giving you anecdotally, I don't say that to patients usually, but I'm telling you what has worked for other moms, but the research does not bear that out. So that's my caveat when I tell a patient. I do, I want them to know. And again, what, what harm, you know, fenugreek I won't use with a bad asthmatic. I tell them, I like fenugreek, but not for you. So let's try something else. Let's try Moringa. Um, you know, so that's how you could take if you feel like that's helpful to you. Okay. I feel, you know, in your practices, if you feel like, eh, you know, send them to lactation, send them to me, send them to Dr. Sender's office, Dr. Witt. Um, you know, but some of the more basic things, if you're comfortable with and know, we know patients are taking herbs for lots of things, right? So, you know, know that patients are like this. So know your patient. Ask them, do you like herbs? Do you like the idea of that or no? No. Don't. Okay. Uh, what else on that? Oh, wait a minute. Okay. I'm peridone. Don't use it, basically. Um, reglan. Now, this I use quite a bit. 
uh, when needed. So it's a dopamine agonist also, anti-emetic. I'm sure you've heard of it and used it perhaps in your practices. Um, increases the PRL secretion, has some side effects, GRE disturbances, insomnia, severe depression for mom. That's that's my biggest fear with these postpartum women that, you know, am I, if they're already prone to depression, and we have that discussion. I don't want you to take this if you're really prone to depression. This type of depression stops immediately when you stop the med, though. So it's not like going to linger on with depression um, when you use this. Um, so we talk about that. And some of these, they're usually our mom gets these symptoms, but some of these symptoms the baby will sometimes get mild, usually GI disturbances. They might have more stools or looser stools with it. Um, there was a seizure in one infant um, on a study. So I don't know if it was caused by this or not, but you know, you know, you have to look at the research and decide what the risk benefit. Is. So this is usually 10 milligrams orally, three to four times a day, um, in, in usually seven to 10 days, and then I, I like to taper the dose. Um, that's usually what you'll see in the literature to taper, and you can repeat the series. Um, have to be cautious. They, they're worried about the baby with long-term use because there just isn't enough. They, they feel it's safe. The uh, Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine feels it's safe, but I have used it for months, two, two months, two and a half months for mom. As a peds NP, if the mom's not a teen, I can't prescribe that, so I work closely with the OB. I'll call the OB and I write the whole dose out and say, this is what I'd recommend. How are you feeling about doing this? And most of my OB colleagues know for you and they're happy to do it and see how it works. And I have had really good success for a lot of moms with this. But again, you have to select the right mom. Um, so difficult to research, but fun galacticogs that I will tell moms again with that caveat. So oatmeal um, is an easy thing to say. And a lot of moms say, oh, yeah, that's working. Uh, it has to be old fashioned. Not quick cook. It has to be old-fashioned cook, um, not instant, not not fast. Brewer's yeast, you know, not many people have that handy. It is the yeast that they make beer. So you may have heard people say that, oh, you know, beer will help your milk supply. The research shows it might dehydrate you and it might actually decrease your supply. So it's kind of on the fence whether you should drink beer. Um, but the brewer's yeast in it may help. Anecdotally, again, it's a galacticog that doesn't have a lot of research on it. Um, it's got a strong kind of nutty taste, so <laughs> some people like it they or, or they don't. Lactation cookies usually have brewer's yeast and oatmeal in it. So when you hear moms, and they set, they're expensive too, so when you hear moms talking about it, um, that's usually, well, just make your own oatmeal and brewer's yeast cookies. Um, that will do the thing. Flaxseed on ginger, carrot, fennel, we talked about Gatorade. A lot of moms will swear by Gatorade. I don't know. There's electrolytes. So if you don't mind Gatorade, maybe. And at least fluid, and it's non-alcoholic, non-caffeine fluid, um, which is great. My, my absolute favorite was a family from Micronesia who told me black chicken. And I'm like, what's black chicken? Get in Cleveland? Yes, you can. At Asian markets, they say it's a chicken, that the bones are black, everything is black, and it doesn't taste very good. You have to spice the heck out of it. In Micronesia, they swear by it. You have to be eating black chicken. So here are kinds of fun, fun things that moms swear by, families, cultures swear by. Um, i got to go faster. So no pain, so um, that can be a problem for moms um, that you may see, and it's a reason that moms will often stop breastfeeding. So, you know, talk to moms about that. I tell moms the first one to two weeks to have a vacuum on your nipples for every two hours, you're going to be tender. Uh, if it's pinching, burning, twisting, tugging, if the mom's making a face when the baby's latching, there's usually usually something worse going on. Latch, mouth, something else going on. So, you know, we look at location, all the things you normally do as you assess. Thorough of the baby, is there oral candidiasis? Is there diaper candidiasis? Always treat man baby if she's breastfeeding um, for candidiasis. Um, 
and we've had that improper latch done to your great lactation team. Um, I mean, you know, when we treat, there is treatment, we'll get to that in a second. The most common source of infection for an actual nipple infection, which is not all that common to actually have an infection in the nipple when you're breastfeeding, it's aphorias. So the thing is you don't really want to culture because that staph is in the skin. And so to really tease it out and strep. Um, um, a little bit about the tethered label, labial frenulum with nipple pant also. So that one's fairly severe, but even that, if you can see that fairly well, I wouldn't, I would see if mom has pain. I might see that and mom's fine and there's a great milk supply and I would do nothing with that. But usually that lip is not moving very well. Um, and I'm going, ouch, when the baby's down. It's a little harder to clip than, than the little glossia. Ankyloglossia, I don't know how well you can see that little string under the skin. There's four stages of ankyloglossia when you get at this level of doing it. Um, again, I've seen severe, severe with no problem. Ankyloglossia can cause um, nipple pain and low supply. The baby can't latch well. There are structural uh, issues with the baby. Look for high arch palate, micronathia, micro, macroglossia, cleft lip, cleft palate, all those things, variations in the mouth. Um, basic things for moms, air out your nipples after you nurse. Avoid soaps and anything that would dry the nipples. Osterade, lanolin, or your own breast milk squeezed on your nipples is just as effective in research. That's Evidence based that it's cheaper. You can milk, put it on your nipple, and let it dry. Uh, modifications of positions. So many women think they can only be in certain positions. I have babies standing on their heads almost sometimes, and they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I was allowed to move the baby. Yeah, so different positions. If that position always hurts, let's try something else. Okay. Nipples, should I mention to you, I use them, but be cautious. The milk supply away with it, so watch that. Massage and pain meds. Um, that's a picture. I don't know how well it's showing up, but that's a nice deep latch. So if you get a chance to see the baby latching, the treatment for nipple pain is laid back nursing. This we love this leaning back. If you have a reclining chair, this works wonders and it feels better. Usually we use things like that for cleft lip and palate things that are down. Syndrome that is really having trouble latching. Um, cup pads for mom, these hydro gels um, are very common to use. Don't use them with lanolin or, or creams, they can have a, a reaction and hurt her skin. Epsom salt rinse is wonderful. Simple, simple, I love the simple things. Um, half a teaspoon to eight ounces in a shot glass, they can hold that on their nipple, it feels great. Rinse it off, the babies don't like the salty taste. Poultices and those of you who do wound care, black tea and take acid, right? It's wonderful for a lot of wound care. So I highly recommend that all the time for really sore nipples that are cracked and, and tender. Um, so black tea in particular usually use what we're all because of the tannic acid, but chamomile and marshmallow root tea are also used. A couple, you know, five minutes, times a day. You might need to rinse it off if the baby doesn't like the taste. saying to watch your clothes. Just a picture of it there. There's different sizes. Uh, I do want to get in. I know I'm running low on time, but all this nipple clean, cream. So I love Thomas Hale. He's the guru of breastfeeding medicine. Um, and this is a simple one that if you have a mom with really broken down nipples, um, this can be over the counter. So you can recommend this. And he, on his website, Site, you can get the directions for this and you'll see the uh, resource for you. But it's half hydrocortisone ointment, 1%, half polysporin ointment. Watch the polysporin because some people get in reaction. But usually, not equal amounts of height of the nipples. After feedings, you don't need to wipe it off. And then it does wonders. The trickier one is this one, which is Dr. Newman. This has Bactroban in it, and this has to go to a compounding pharmacy. So it's a little trickier to get. Um, Soulsby on the east side does this for me, and they'll ship it right to the family if you know if the family can afford to ship it to them. It's like $15. But this is similar, so 
it's atropine and then betamethasone 0.1 percent, and then myconazole powder. That's why it goes to compounding pharmacy. Okay, and then you put it on sparingly and don't need to wash it off. Afraid, am I out of time? Is my timer two minutes? Okay, let's see. Um, mastitis. Mm, no, it's, it's not common, and you certainly are not seeing it. It's so rare in the first week. So when I hear people say, "I had mastitis on day four, I'm like, I don't think so, but it's possible, you know, because that's actually an infection. So now that women get sick with mastitis, they're they're sick. It's like a flu. Um, often, not always, but a red triangle on their breast. Usually on breast. If they're telling you both breasts hurt, it's very unusual that that would be mastitis in both sides. Possible, but unusual. Okay. Yes, snack and blood sugar. Um, so now we, you can possibly not treat with antibiotics as your first line of defense with mastitis. So again, usually you're sending to OB. Usually the peds people are not doing this. I go to the OB and tell them, she got mastitis, give her to you or do you want to just do this? And then I give my recommendation. So um, switching nurse if they have mastitis, it won't hurt the baby. Um, massaging the feed with an edible oil, like uh, olive oil is fine, or coconut oil. Um, hand pumping or expressing if they if they can't get the milk out if it's painful, um, and the, or also reclining. That reclining position can be great if a mom's uncomfortable. Nursing hurts. Mastitis hurts. Um, so find that it's painful. And then your anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen, antibiotics. If you're not seeing improvement with these more uh, palliative type things within 12 to 24 hours, then you need to move to antibiotics for mom. Um, or if she's acutely ill and you just think this is just really not good. Um, so um, dicloxacillin or fluoxacillin, 500 milligrams four times a day for 10 to 14 days, full treatment. Um, and there's a penicillin analogy. Geez, you can use stuff. Um, there's more cases of MRSA. Um, if you know, if mom had had a history of MRSA, you might want to do a breastfeeding culture. They're tricky. I, I do them, but they're they're a little tricky because stuff and other things. And so we talked about um, mastitis. Women who quickly get mastitis or plug ducts. Often, if a mom has a plug duct, it can lead to mastitis. We will use lecithin, which is a soy product, um, and we'll use that continuously while she's nursing. I just had a mom two weeks ago that she said, I had mastitis and plug ducts the whole time with that last child. I want lecithin. Tell me again how much. And so we just got it. You know, it's a soy product. She had no soy allergies, no allergies. So um, 1,200 milligrams three to four times a day for one two weeks and then 1,200 once a day uh, maintenance dose. So four plug ducts, you do that three to four times a day. And then if for maintenance to prevent plug ducts, um, you can go to once a day. Probiotics too, some, some reports show that that's helpful, but again, more research is needed. There's sources for families that you can consider. Kelly Mom is a great resource. I hope you've heard of it. Um, the, the Mommy Meds app. The, a lot of moms will ask you what medications they can breastfeed with. Um, that's the Infant Risk Center at Texas Tech. They're phenomenal. You can call them, and they will give you an answer of, like, is this med okay um, for, for this family? Um, your breastfeeding consultants are wonderful. My breastfeeding clinic, that is my direct number. So, you know, you can call me directly if you have any questions. I'm always happy to help. And I take direct calls from moms in my office. I'm happy to help my email address. And Dr. Witt's clinic, Breastfeeding Medicine of Northeast Ohio. It's in South Euclid. It's pretty far. So maybe for your, your folks might be good. Um, but we're down at Main Campus Metro, so West 25th is where I'm at. With I have a partner, Dr. Uh, a family practice doc works me, doc, Dr. Megan Combs, who wanted to be part of the clinic, and I said, well, you have to become an IVLC. She did. She's wonderful. Um, 
and then justice for that for that service down. Um, and services for you as providers, LACTMED, it's a little above um, patients' heads, I think, because I'll just describe all the research. So LACTMED is wonderful when you're like, and herbals are in there. So the, the lady who said, I'm not sure, you can look at those and say, okay, well, one patient and, you know, had something, but it looks pretty safe. Um, lactation education resources online. Um, the Goals of Lactation started that organization. There's free handouts in multiple languages there. So if you're struggling, Arabic and some unusual languages too, that's a great resource for you. Okay, and then the references for you. Any, I'm sorry, to, I know I'm a talker. Yeah. Questions about flat nipples in the pregnancy and maybe a previous uh, couplet nursing that didn't go well and now she's having another baby. Um, flat nipples. <laughs> The first few days, sometimes it's a problem, but usually that baby can work with it. So flat nipples tend to not be as bad of a problem as you might think. Inverted nipples, even. I have had great success. You can nipple roll, gently take the nipple and roll it like a pea or a marble in your hand. 15 seconds, it'll pop out a little bit and sometimes enough to grab. I will use the nipple shield. We tend to use that a lot right after birth. The nipple shield will get put on um, because the baby can't grasp on well. But again, you want to then get rid of it. You use it as a tool, but get rid of it within a few days if you can. We had one baby that nursed till six months with no supply issue with the shield who refused. And that was a parenting issue, right? <laughs> they wouldn't want to give it up. Yeah. 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 The question. So going back to work is the question. So, so the first month, let them establish milk supply if they're fortunate enough not to go back to work too fast. Some of the patients I see are going going back in three weeks, and we don't have much time. But the idea is nurse for most of the, the first month and then start storing. Um, you're pumping once or twice a day to, to store and freeze. Freeze in the back of your freezer. Don't freeze in the door. That's the warmest part, so you want to keep it as cold as possible if you have a regular refrigerator like most of us. A deep freeze, it can, you can keep it warm. Um, but, yeah, I have them breastfeed only the first three to four weeks, then, you know, most women get three months off, not always, but, you know, and I always ask that, when do you go back to work? And we start planning right away, even if I'm seeing them at three days old, like, when do you go back to work? <laughs> at three weeks, okay, so let's start pumping and, and give it a week, and then we're going to start pumping so you can start getting the supply, yeah. And usually a lot of babies don't like taking the bottle from mom, yeah, sometimes somebody else asks Breastfeeding law, you know, Obamacare for worse did so much for breastfeeding, right? Any, any place with 50 employees or more must accommodate breastfeeding, okay? You must get breaks for breastfeeding, and that's in addition to your lunch. You know, that, that's not your lunch hour, and it can't be a bathroom. It has to be somewhere that's, you know, a decent place to pump, not just in some corner bathroom. Anything else? Well, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun.